Hello, welcome to Washington Talk. I'm Young Gyo Kim. In Madrid, NATO leaders proclaimed a united front, stating the Western Security Alliance has faced a direct threat and serious challenges from Russia and China, respectively. And for the first time in nearly five years, leaders of the U.S., South Korea, and Japan got together, reaffirming to step up security ties in order to counter the North Korean aggression. Today, we'll discuss how all these will change the security environment amid North Korea's nuclear threats. Our trilateral cooperation, in my view, is essential to achieving our shared objective, including a complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and a free and open Indo-Pacific. In the studio with me is Michael O'Hanlon, Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution. Dr. O'Hanlon specializes in the U.S. defense strategy and national security policy. He authored numerous books, including Crisis on the Korean Peninsula. Also joining me is Marcus Galaskas, non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Mr. Galaskas served as the National Intelligence Officer for North Korea on the National Intelligence Council at the Office of the Director of National Intelligence from 2014 to 2020. Welcome to the show. Good to have you both today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, the leaders for the first time, of the, the leaders of the Indo-Pacific countries, such as South Korea, Japan, and were invited to a NATO meeting. Uh, Dr. Ohello, what was the meaning of these leaders of these countries participating in the NATO summit? Well, one thing is that our strategy for dealing even with the immediate crisis in Europe is largely a global economic strategy. Mm -hmm. And it has to do, of course, with various kinds of sanctions, export controls, and other restrictions on doing business with Russia. And that, therefore, there's no reason why geography should dictate who's involved in that effort. And certainly important American allies in the Asia Pacific are going to have a role in sanctioning Russia. But beyond that, of course, China is now seen as a major security challenge, even within the NATO space, even within Europe and North America. And not so much necessarily because of military contingency planning, but more because of China's economic and technological encroachment, uh, its desires to sell 5G networks, its desires to acquire uh, high technology assets from Western countries and therefore beef up not only its own economy, but its own military potential. And so I think NATO has recognized that China is a potential concern for NATO. And it's not that the NATO alliance is going to send a big joint armada from European waters through the Suez Canal all the way out to the Western Pacific to face down the PRC. More likely than not, it's going to be rather uh, a competition in the economic realms. There's a lot of concern about resilience of supply chains, about other kinds of preparations to make sure that China can't hurt us, that if there were a Taiwan contingency, uh, that Europe would not suffer economically, that, or at least that it would not be vulnerable to Chinese economic coercion of one type or another. And so again, bringing in the whole family, so to speak, all the major Western mm -hmm. allies, uh, makes sense whether you're thinking about a Russia or a China challenge. Mm -hmm. Mr. Galaskas, what's your thought on this? Yeah, so I think a lot of what Michael just mm -hmm. said makes sense. The, the one important element that I would add is the nuclear aspect that uh -huh. I think is hanging over this, this discussion. Uh, the, the way that Russia is leveraging its nuclear capability to essentially cast a nuclear shadow over the, uh, the uh, attack on Ukraine, uh, I think that is a model um, that uh, other adversaries could use in the future. And uh, allowing uh, Russia to essentially get away with that right, um, is not something that's in anyone's interest. And so I think showing solidarity among all of the uh, like-minded countries in the world that have to deal with a potential nuclear-armed adversary uh, looking at Russia, China, and North Korea specifically, I think that's really critical. Um, and the reverse is also true, uh, thinking about not just the example that Russia could set, but conversely, if North Korea is allowed to continue 
uh, to, to push the norms on, uh, on, on nuclear weapons testing, uh, even to the point of em employing a nuclear demonstration or using one in a, in a conflict, even in a limited way. This would have huge ramifications for nuclear deterrence uh, of China and of, uh, of Russia in the future. So I think there's a great common interest uh, between these sets of alliances um, to really uh, focus on d deterring and controlling the, uh, the risk of a nuclear conflict. Mm -hmm. And in terms of North Korea, much attention was paid to the three-way discussion among the U.S., South Korea, and Japan. And it was the first time U.S. President Joe Biden, South Korea President Yoon suk yeol and Japanese Prime Minister Kishida Fumio, three of them got together in one place. So, Mr. Galaskas, would you say this was the right move for these three leaders? No, I think it was absolutely the right move, and I think it's, uh, frankly, long overdue. Uh, we had a real, uh, I would say, set of setbacks um, and some deterioration in the trilateral security cooperation uh, between the, the U.S., uh, the ROK, and Japan. Uh, and, and I think this is a, a step toward getting things on a, on a better path. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wouldn't uh, overestimate um, the, the impact of, of, of this meeting, but I think it sets a very positive tone uh, for a better direction. I think security cooperation between uh, those three countries is, is really important uh, to stability in Northeast Asia, not just uh, for dealing with North Korea, but in, in general. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and again, I, I think it's a, it's a significant step forward, but certainly a lot more work to be done, I think, in that mm -hmm. space. Dr. Hoilan, do you sense some kind of a winds of change in terms of a relationship among these three countries? Because uh, South Korean Yoon Sung, uh, President Yoon Sung-yeol, he has been emphasizing how South Korea and Japanese relationship should be improved. Yeah, certainly that is the crucial piece at this mm -hmm. point. Obviously, we create our own challenges here during mm -hmm. the Trump years in particular. And President Trump certainly made it pretty clear that he did like Prime Minister Abe and did not particularly care for the U.S. ROK relationship on mm -hmm. economic or security terms. Mm -hmm. And so certainly in recent years, Donald Trump was a part of the challenge. Uh, whether you like him or not, uh, I don't support him, but, you know, he did try deliberately to royal the U.S. ROK alliance. Mm -hmm. uh, however, since his departure from the White House, I think the U.S. peace has been very solid in both directions, towards Tokyo and towards Seoul. But obviously, Seoul and Tokyo were having issues with each other. Mm -hmm. and, and as Marcus says, that's not going to go away completely anytime soon. Mm -hmm. And frankly, on another dimension, on a policy dimension of things, I think we in the United States need to hear from the Republic of Korea on how to think about China. Mm -hmm. Because I think that sometimes, sometimes we can overdo it a little. Uh, and focus a bit too much on China as the likely next adversary, whereas the ROK has a more pragmatic perspective in many situations mm -hmm. because it lives next to China. It's situated next to China. Koreans will be neighbors of, of China forever. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes that makes the ROK a little more pragmatic, a little more conciliatory. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's good for us to hear. So that's one more dimension to this three-way conversation that I think is important to mm -hmm. watch. I'll touch up on that China issue a little bit later on. The three leaders agreed that they need to beef up uh, regional deterrence against North Korea. And at the same time, there was news that U.S. and South Korea are seeking uh, to additional, additional sanctions on North Korea. So, Dr. Ohelon, do you expect to see pressures increase on North Korea uh, both militarily and sanction-wise? It seems like the United States is pretty convinced North mm -hmm. Korea is going to do its seventh nuclear test, and I gather mm -hmm. that South Koreans are of a similar view. Mm -hmm. I hope they're all wrong. We know that intelligence can be wrong. Mm -hmm. We also know North Korea could change its mind. Mm -hmm. So uh, one thing I would like to see the Biden team do more, as well as President Yoon, mm -hmm is to think about a more creative and flexible diplomatic strategy towards North Korea. Simply saying that we're ready to talk anytime, anyplace, that's not a strategy. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly not likely to persuade Kim Jong-un to come talk. So I've long been of the view that if we insist on complete North Korean denuclearization as the first objective of any deal or as the essential objective of any deal, we're gonna fail. Mm -hmm. uh, the North Koreans have seen what happened to Saddam Hussein and Muammar Gaddafi when they fought without nuclear weapons and they both wound up dead. So uh, the North Koreans are not gonna give up all their bombs all at once. I think we need to try to convince them to get rid of their production capability and stop testing. And in exchange for that, a partial lifting of sanctions. But the Biden administration doesn't seem to have that same inclination. Either they disagree with me or they just are afraid of the politics. Mm. And this is not a way of saying that we allow North Korea to keep its nuclear arsenal. It's a way to say rather, we focus first and foremost on preventing that arsenal from growing or improving. And then in a second subsequent 
negotiation worry about denuclear, denuclearization. Mm -hmm. So that's, to me, the, the, the missing strategy that I hope somebody will propose and discuss. Mr. Galaskas, what's your thought? Do you agree? So, so I think there's a, there's a fundamental, uh, two, two related ideas here. So one uh, is, is the idea that we have to acknowledge that North Korea is nuclear armed and is going to stubbornly remain so for the foreseeable future, at least as long as Kim Jong-un is in power, right? Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean giving up on the principle of, of denuclearization right. being the goal, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, I think it sounds like we agree on that. Uh, and I think that the, the question is managing the risks uh, dealing with the challenges posed by North Korea in the interim. Uh, and a lot of it comes down to deterrence and, and pressure. And my big concern has been, and what, what I think we've seen for 20 years, is that the vain hope of trying to get North Korea to denuclearize um, has uh, caused us then to uh, hold back on taking some actions in the deterrent space that we should take, um, and has also, in some cases, actually caused us not to, to take pressure actions, right? And certainly, China's view on, on sanctions has, has always been um, that, that sanctions are, uh, are in, in some ways, an impediment to diplomacy, right? Uh, and so, so China's ability to, uh, to put the sanctions issue forward uh, as uh, essentially to block uh, the, the uh, economic pressure on North Korea, I think, has been one of the key uh, divergences that has allowed this situation to, uh, to get worse. So, so the, you ban the discussion uh, about sanctions, I think, regardless of what additional measures are taken uh, at, the, uh, at the UN or unilaterally or multilaterally, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's all about enforcement, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so um, if there's not uh, major pressure uh, on, on North Korea, I don't even think an, a, um, a limited deal is really possible. Uh, and, and so I think it, it's a bit early to be, be talking about relieving sanctions that are already deteriorating on their own. They're wasting asset as they are. So if you're going to use uh, sanctions as a bargaining chip as leverage, they have to be strengthened first in terms of enforcement before they have the, the, uh, the leverage to be able to have an effect. But, uh, but to go back to my, my earlier point, mm -hmm. what I'm really concerned about, though, is how much this focus on achieving a negotiated solution has prevented us from taking the necessary deterrent actions in the face of the continued progress that, that North Korea is making. Well, well I think this one day is not enough to really debate <laughs> yeah. about this issue. Right. But I'll move on. South Korean President Yoon urged NATO countries to work more closely on resolving North Korea's uh, nuclear issue. Mr. Galaska, so what kind of a cooperation is possible with NATO in dealing with North Korea? And I think interoperability between NATO military forces, um, and ROK uh, and Japanese forces and equipment is really critical um, because when you look at the situation in Ukraine, it's a great example, uh, is you've got this, uh, this situation where you, you want to provide arms, you want to provide support to a country, but there's a technological base and there's a training base that isn't exactly where you want it to be, right? And so it's causing some challenges. So just in a scenario where, say, there's a, a conflict in, uh, you know, either in Europe or on the, uh, you know, on the Korean Peninsula, say, in East Asia, the ability to, to transfer munitions, um, to provide equipment, to provide training, to provide support, even without being directly involved in combat, mm -hmm. there's real military value to that. And there's value, I think, to having uh, training to deal with a whole range of issues where NATO uh, the ROK and Japan can, can work together. I mean, remember, NATO deployed forces to Afghanistan, right? Well, outside of Europe. Um, so I don't think the idea of a joint uh, deployment of uh, ROK and maybe even Japanese forces and NATO forces to deal with some, some crisis, some contingency, even outside of area, uh, I, I don't think we should rule that out. So things don't happen overnight. So I think we're just at the very early stages of seeing what's possible. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hola. Yeah, I agree with that. And in fact, I think interoperability is the right focal point, much more so than the debate we've been having with, within the alliance over operational uh, control and command and, and, and the transition of that from mm. American leadership to Korean leadership. I think that debate has not been very useful uh, because first of all, any co conflict in Korea would become regional and perhaps global. Therefore, I think the United States should remain mm -hmm. the first among equals in the military command arrangement. I'm sorry to sound like an ugly American, but that's uh, we have a $750, $800 billion defense budget backed up by 5,000 nuclear weapons. And even though I think the ROK has one of the five best militaries on Earth, it's a much smaller military. So I think that debate has distracted us from a more important debate about how to actually work well together. The good news is this is the most integrated alliance on the planet, the U.S. ROK alliance, in terms of tactical and theater level cooperation. 
but it can get better and it mm -hmm. should get better. And then it can be extended to involve other countries too. Mm -hmm. And China outright showed displeasure about this NATO uh, gathering, saying it is stirring up the Asia Pacific region. And North Korea also said the US and its Asian allies are taking a step toward Asian NATO. And with what is happening with Russia, some say this could be the beginning of the Cold War. Is that true? Well, first of all, China's got to be careful here because if it thinks it's insulting us by talking about an Asian NATO, we're not going to have one, but <laughs> so what if we do? I mean, NATO is a great organization. I think it, NATO made a mistake in offering membership to Ukraine and Georgia. I do criticize us for that judgment, mm -hmm. but the organization is sensational. It's the greatest alliance in world history, and it won the Cold War without firing a shot. It's a defensive alliance. We just had a big setback in Afghanistan, but that was a far less important conflict than winning the Cold War. So um, I don't take the idea of an Asian NATO as an insult, <laughs> but, but we know that most of our partners in the region are primarily interested in the bilateral relationships with the United States. We mm -hmm. just saw that the ROK and Japan had a meeting together with us for the first time in five years. Um, there's not going to be an Asian NATO. It's a different theater. Mm -hmm. But if there were, so what? Mm -hmm. uh, so China's really got to also think about its own actions and how those actions are uniting a lot of us in worrying more about China. By the same token, however, I will add this one slightly uh, detente oriented point, I think we should acknowledge that China has not done everything Vladimir Putin wants them to do in this conflict. Mm -hmm. Putin wants Chinese arms. The Chinese have said no at every turn. And the Chinese have also restricted their exports of high technology goods to Russia during this conflict. Yes, they're buying more oil from Russia. That's bad. Mm -hmm. But China's hedging its bets. So we have to be careful here in the United States not to somehow portray Russia, China as this new axis that's completely unified and completely against us. That's too much of a simplification and it works against our own interests. Mr. Kalaska, so we're not going back to the old time like Cold, cold War. No, I, I think uh, perhaps it's it's a type of Cold War, but it is not like the Cold War. And that's the, it's a mental model it's very easy to fall into. But I, I think it's important to keep in mind that that even if, if actors are not uh, together in, a, in any sort of formal alliance or closely cooperating, uh, the, the fact of the matter is, is that that de facto China is, is, is providing tremendous support to both North Korea and Russia uh, that make them much more uh, dangerous actors. Uh, and so figuring out how you, how you best deal with that, particularly considering what's going on at the United Nations Security Council, where you essentially have Russia and China presenting a united front to protect each other and then also to protect the North Koreans. Um, and so, so if there is a, uh, if there is a, a, a Cold War uh, type model emerging, it's one I think that looks very different um, than, the, than the Cold War of the, uh, the 20th century that we're all familiar with. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, North Korea said earlier it is reshuffling its frontline units on the border as Kim Jong-un emphasizes boosting the country's war deterrent. And many analysts speculate this could mean Pyongyang deploying tactical nuclear weapons along the border. Mr. Galaskas, is this likely? So I, I, uh, I think speculate's a good word, right? I mean, so we ha we'll have to see what's going to happen, but I think the possibility of North Korea both testing um, and then deploying a tactical nuclear weapon is a very realistic possibility. And it remains to be seen um, you know, when this will happen and how this would play out. But I think it's a, it's a great concern for deterrence because I think it's the most likely situation where a nuclear weapon could be used for the foreseeable future is if North Korea does deploy tactical weapons and there is a, there is a crisis, confrontation, a conflict, uh, that I think the incentives are there for North Korea from their own mindset, their own logic to think using a tactical weapon could advance the regime's objectives, allow the regime to survive, and create a dilemma for, for the uh, US, the international community, the ROK, um, to respond to that, that tactical use. So it's something we should be concerned about, um, and it's something that we should not wait for the North Koreans to, to do it, or we shouldn't even necessarily worry so much about how likely or unlikely it is. We should be prepared for the possibility. We should be preparing now and acting as though um, that is just over the horizon, because this is not something um, that, uh, that is just business as usual. This will start to change the deterrence and escalation environment on the peninsula, I think, in very significant ways in the coming year. So we need to assume that it's going to happen and be ready for it. I think that's why it's important to actually think about our strategy for dealing with North Korea now. Because what I, what I mean by that is, if the North Koreans test, that's a good moment to try to put pressure on Russia and China to tighten up sanctions enforcement. But Russia and China are not gonna do it if we continue to have an unrealistic strategy for ever dealing with North Korea, if they just see this as a punishment strategy and nothing but that. So I think you have to have the sanctions be in service of a realistic strategy, which means you can't wait until after the test 
to talk about a less ambitious denuclearization agenda. Mm -hmm. if you, that, that sounds like you're conceding at the barrel of a gun. So I think we should do it now, in fact, right now, in fact, th in the next few weeks, uh, and, and indicate that we are open to the possibility of partial sanctions relief for verifiable dismantlement of North Korean nuclear production capability of a comprehensive nature. I realize that the <laughs> National, <laughs> National Intelligence Council uh, and, and elsewhere, they, they can't be sure where all the North Korean stuff might be, but we know where a lot of it is, and it's going to be hard for them to fool us on an industrial scale. Yeah. Mike, Michael, I got to disagree with you there. I, I think thinking that uh, that that level of denuclearization by North Korea is more realistic than full denuclearization. I think that's kind of like saying uh, King Kong is more realistic than Godzilla. I think both of those right now, in the current circumstances, are, are really not realistic uh, possibilities. Um, and I think we've neglected one other element of the sanctions conversation that's key: is that the original purpose of the sanctions. Uh, really was more about restricting the ability of North Korea to develop and then to proliferate the programs. Um, and recently, we've much more focused on the idea of them providing leverage for negotiations. And my, my concern is, and I, and I think this is something we really need to take seriously, is that the types of relief that would be offered in North Korea might actually allow them to build out parts of their program much more quickly. Um, and so there's a resource element that's very key here is one of the reasons North Korea hasn't uh, made progress more quickly is because they don't have the resources to fully um, build out their programs, right? They're advancing in testing, but uh, I, I question whether or not they have the resources really to, to take full advantage of, of, uh, of, of the progress that they've made. Um, and if you relieve the sanctions, you may stop the testing, but then they get the resources then to build out the programs, so right? And that's, that's a problem. So let's have a debate within the U.S. government and the, the alliance about which sanctions to relieve. Mm -hmm. I take your point. Uh, but that's the conversation we're not even having internally, as best I can tell right now, because we're just not being very creative on our strategy. So I, I think that's a problem, because I don't think China and Russia are going to join in on a tightening of sanctions unless we have a plausible path forward subsequently. Yeah, and I don't think Russia and China also are going to, going to be on board with stronger sanctions unless they understand how it's going to affect them. I mean, one of the big factors here is there's so many Russian and Chinese institutions um, and, and organizations, individuals, that you see open source information um, of their involvement um, in, uh, in the sanctions evasion. Um, and so until you are able to demonstrate to Russia and China that there's not just a kind of a, a ethereal political cost to backing North Korea, but that there's a practical economic cost, I, I think you, you won't see that, that progress. It right. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts honestly and passionately. I have to ask the last question. So it's kind of a will be summary of what you both of you discussed today. Dr. O'Hanlon, so what is the way to make a breakthrough with North Korea? Well, I think we've clarified one thing, which yeah. is there is no short, easy way. Mm -hmm. I, and, and we may have differing opinions as to optimal strategy. But again, I'm just going to reiterate, since you asked, that we have to keep strong deterrence. Doesn't necessarily mean resumption of large scale exercises, mm -hmm. but it means a lot of good small and medium sized exercises, uh, improved op interoperability, mm -hmm. less obsession with the operational command transition issue and more with interoperability and joint training. And, and yet at the same time, a more integrated strategy for how we can try to engage North Korea diplomatically once that becomes possible. Not mm -hmm. because it'll happen soon, but because in the absence of such a strategy, we won't be able to get the kind of cooperation with Russia, China, and others that we need. Mm -hmm. So we've had several false breakthroughs with North Korea over the years. I think to have a true breakthrough that fundamentally changes the nature of North Korea's relationship with the world, that fundamentally puts us on a path where North Korea, where the Kim regime or its successor would be willing to give up nuclear weapons, is there has to be domestic change within North Korea. And we can do a lot of things to foster that. Um, but at the end of the day, it's going to be up to the, the North Korean elite, the North Korean people uh, to make that change. And we need to be ready for it. We need to foster the conditions for it. We need to deter in the meantime. But we need to recognize there's not going to be a breakthrough um, until there is a fundamental change in calculus uh, from North Korea on, on their relationship with the world and their nuclear program. And, and, and we, we don't get to control that when that happens. Mm -hmm. A latest report showed North Korea has allegedly stole $100 million worth of cryptocurrency yet in another heist. And it seems like the nosedive in cryptocurrency market is not stopping North Korea from going after these assets as the regime continues to seek funding for its illegal nuclear and missile programs. Dr. O'Hellen and Mr. Galaskas, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that does it for this week's Washington Talk from Voice of America. Please join us again next week for more analysis.